but we are equally delighted and honored to welcome Lillian Judd and her son Dennis, who by the way is celebrating his 60th birthday today. Woo! as well that we have them so appropriately for the Adele Cycle Bell Memorial Lecture. Professor Goodman will now tell you a bit about Adele Cycle Bell and introduce you. The picture on the left is, was taken of Adele Zeigelbaum on her wedding day. And that is a more uh, contemporary photo. I don't know when it was taken, but I think you can see the, the smile, the quiet smile. Um, Adele Ziegelbaum was born in a small town near Krakow, Poland in 1924. As you know, the Germans invaded Poland in 1935. She was only 15 years old. In 1941, the Jews in her town were moved into a ghetto, and later that year she was separated from her parents and her two sisters, having lost track of her brother previously. She never saw her parents, her brother, or her younger sister again. Adele was eventually subjected to forced labor in a German factory making soles for shoes, then in a munitions factory filling shells with gunpowder. Fearing she might be poisoned by the chemicals in the gunpowder, she informed a German engineer that she knew how to do electric welding, a skill that her father taught her during their time when they were in the ghetto. Adele and other prisoners often sabotaged shells by overfilling them. And then when she moved on to making shell casings, she often did a rather poor job of welding. In 1944, she was liberated by the Russian army, and following six weeks of treatment for malnutrition, she returned to her hometown and was reunited with her older sister, who had survived the camps. In December of 1945, Adele married Joseph L. Zygelbaum, a well-known hero of the Polish underground. The newlyweds moved to a displaced persons camp and eventually emigrated to the U.S. in late 1946. Their first son, who is with us today, Arthur, was born in early 1947, and later that year the family moved to Los Angeles. Their second son, Paul, who is also with us, was born in 1950. She and Joseph became American citizens in 1952. And after Joseph's death, she moved to Santa Rosa. In the oral history that she gave us, Adele told us that she never saw a butterfly or a flower or a bird while she was in the camps, and that she used to wish she could become a butterfly so that she could fly gently out through the electrified wire fence without burning her wings. She was seldom without a scarf, a vest, or a piece of jewelry bearing the image of a butterfly. And it was totally appropriate that our logo for the center is, of course, of a butterfly flying over uh, barbed wire. Adele's advice was, quote, never forget what happened, to tell the story so that it will never happen again, to remember the people that we've lost, to honor those who were not even privileged to have their own graves, and to understand that we are not responsible for our births, but we are responsible for our own conduct. Adele died in 2009. We are grateful to her family, her sons, Arthur, and his wife, Christine, and Paul, and his wife, Michelle, who have generously established the Adele Zegelbaum Memorial Endowment in her honor to support the work of the Center for the Study of the Holocaust and Genocide. Um, why don't we give a nice hand to the Zegelbaum family?
It is inspiring to know that through the Zeigelbaum Memorial Fund, we will be able to present a major speaker just about every year in the series. And it assures that we will move on and keep up the high standards. Um, I always stumble across those pictures when I'm going through some of my files, and I always smile because um, I did have occasion to talk to Adele on the phone, and she was quite a woman. In the place of Christopher Browning, I would like to introduce you to Lillian and Dennis Judd. Um, as you know, Dennis is celebrating his birthday, and we didn't find out until last night that Professor Browning was incapacitated and couldn't come. And fortunately, we have some really sharp minds. The president of um, the Alliance said, well, maybe Lillian and Dennis would speak. And I thought, oh my goodness, less than 24 hours notice. Um, I called Dennis and he said, well, I had left a message for him. I could hear Lillian in the background, and he said, Mom said it's okay, we'll come. So um, they have a wonderful um, story to tell you of a journey. Uh, the name of their book is From Nightmare to Freedom. Um, Lillian was born in Czechoslovakia and grew up during the onset of World War II. As a teenager, she was taken to the ghetto in her hometown and then to Auschwitz death camp. Near the end of the war, she was forced to participate in death marches before her liberation and immigration to America. She has lived in Santa Rosa for many years and is an active member of Congregation Beth Ami, um, a local synagogue and community center. It is my great pleasure to present to you Lillian and Dennis Judd. Well, 60 years ago, I never thought I'd be here, but uh, <laughs> here we are. Um, so we're going to be ad-libbing a little bit because we didn't have too much time to prepare totally. Um, Mom will give you the story of her experience, and part of the fascinating part of Mom's story is that when she arrived in Auschwitz, um, it just so happened it was the one time that we're aware of that a German photographer was taking photographs of a train load coming in. And so we were honored to be able to have the permission to use those photographs in our book and in, the, in our program today. The real exciting part was one of the photographs was the picture that included my, my grandmother and my two aunts that were killed in the, at Auschwitz, and then my aunt and my mother who survived. It was right after they murdered my grandfather. So we'll, 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 we've got those photographs, and that I'll show you. I'll be showing those up on the screen here as mom tells her story so you can actually see what was happening at Auschwitz. So here's my mom, Lillian Judd. Thank you, this is me. <laughs> I'm going to try to relate to you all the things that I experienced in Auschwitz, Bergen-Belsen, other camps, and on the death march, and getting home and getting to America. In 1938, I was, I was 14 years old. I just graduated from high school in Czechoslovakia. Our country, our part of our country was, was taken over by Hungarians under the, under the, under the as, as allies to the, to the Nazis. And they came in, in our town, and they became active right away. They took all the Jewish licenses away, permits to operate any business. They separated us. They took everything they could from us in very fast and, 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 and very efficiently. 
They overtook us in 1938, but they didn't give us that to, 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 the, to Auschwitz until 1944. So they would have had time, but they rushed. They didn't want to miss anything from the Jews. It was hard. We were just snuck down in every step. We tried to make forward. We, we knocked two steps backwards. And we still tried. All of a sudden, the, the Jewish boys became forced. It was, it was like uh, the Hungarians created a forced labor camp. Where all the young Jewish boys, men up to 45 from 18, were placed in that camp. And made, made, they made them work very hard in on the street, building streets, digging ditches. Working in the mines. No, something is already fading. Working in the mines, and every now and then they let one or two boys home for a two, three day visit, and they came home and told us about what's happening on the, bo on the border, on the Polish border, how they're killing the Jews, how they're digging the big, big, the big holes with the, with the, what do you call it? Bulldozer, yeah. With the bulldozers and make the Jews stand around it and strip and then they machine gun them down and then they cover them, cover the dead, the injured, and the rivals. And that we, that we, that, that, that were told us by the by those boys. Then they made us wear the yellow stars. We never could go out without it. They always threatened us if they catch us without catch any Jews without a yellow star, they will be severely punished. And to tell you the truth, we were scared. They were very cruel. <clears throat> and, and obviously they hated the Jews or they were taught to hate the Jews. And even the ones that were our friends at one time weren't very nice to us. And then here they were sending us all kind of intimidating letters. Be ready, don't give anything away for your neighbors or to anybody. Or to anybody because you both be punished, the one, the receiver and the giver. So, like I said, we were scared. I lived my life as a teenager the best I could. I went, I, I went to dances, I went to school, but it wasn't the same. Especially when the kids get up, the boys, and said, Jews out over all, where we were going there ever, forever, right? And uh, then we went out and we never came back again. Now, we were getting these letters from the authorities that you have to put everything together, all the jewelries, jewelries, all the cash you have, all the, all the, uh, all the valuables, and keep it, keep it in the house. Then they gave us a day, we went to assemble on, the, on one corner of the, of, of the city, and we all should <coughs> go there and stand in line and wait for everybody to get there. That day was a very, very, very sad day for me too, anyway. When I came and we could only take what we could carry in our hands, in our arms. My, in my family, they were young children. They couldn't carry much. And as we were going, as I was going out, following the kids, they told us, leave everything in the house. 
the, the, the authorities will come in and seal it so that when you come back, you could find everything the way you left it. And that was a big lie. Because we, uh, we didn't know much about politics. We did not, my parents weren't politicians. I, we did, I grew up in a house where there was no electricity, no radio, of course, no television. <laughs> Nobody had television then. But um, we didn't get the news very fast. But we heard enough that, that upset us and made us very sad. The day we left our home, and I came to that corner that was designated for us to meet, I felt sick. It was a very dismal day. It was overcast, drizzling, cry, rather crying going on. Excuse me. Rather crying going on. And when I went out, I saw the old people standing there shaking covering himself up because it was cold. And in their eyes, they spoke with their eyes. I'll never forget those eyes. Why am I here? Why did they take me out of my warm house? Why did I, why did I have to leave my bed so early? What did I do? I haven't done anything to anybody. That's what, that's what I read in their eyes. The kids, the kids were crying with their nose running, coughing. Nobody was happy. So I, I, I joined them, and I felt like crying, too. Well, pretty soon, the lines were filled. Our neighbors were all over. They couldn't do nothing for us. They didn't do nothing for us. They just let us go. And then we were the last one assembled, and we started. They told us, walk. And we're walking. But I have to mention this. We, we got to know my sister and I, the police captain there. <coughs> and he came up to us while we were walking and said to us, Lily and Hersey, if you want to, I, wish I show you how to step aside and come to my house. And Mama, his wife, and, and him will take care of us, of you guys. And that, that really touched me so much that, I, that tears came to my eyes. And I said to him, thank you very much. We said it both, my sister and I together, with one voice, thank you very much. And we will go where, my, where, our, where the rest of our family is going. And he was trying to talk us into a little more. But he didn't get nowhere, so he just left us there. And we were kept marching, and we came to a place where they stopped us in front of the, the closed gate. And they opened the gate all wired. And they brought us into it, in, and we stopped, and they, and they said, "Now this is the, this is the brick factory, and this is your ghetto." I've never heard the the word ghetto before. Well, I was just thinking, well, we'll see what's what. Then I saw there, I saw how there were a lot of Jewish people from all over the the area, the neighborhood. The, 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 the villages, they were all brought in with their families and put into these shelves where they used to save, the, used to put the bricks when they took them out from the kiln, and they used to put the bricks into those shelves to cool off. Now, there were Jews there. There were people, children, old people, and straw. That's what I saw there. There was no room for us anymore there, thank God. I, we were on the ground, on the bare ground. But we did the best we could. 
And after a while, we, the six weeks passed away. We didn't, we hardly had what to eat already. And then they decided, now it's the time came for relocation. But when they talked about relocation, they didn't say much. So that we kind of let known that we were, we're going to work someplace and exist and live and let live. And that's what we thought. As we were walking and I, from the ghetto, we walked, they told us, bring all you have and, and come on, uh, meet us on another corner. By the by, close to that um, brick factory. <coughs> My dad was fighting in World War One, and he was injured in the, in her, his leg. There, and his walking wasn't so good and wasn't so fast. And this Hitler Jugends that they brought in, that the Nazis brought in, they all had whips. And they were just hitting with the whips if someone didn't walk fast enough. And I, I, my, my, I had my dad holding me by my shoulder on one side, and the other side he was holding his cane. And we were trying to walk as fast as we could so we wouldn't be hit. We walk and walk. Then I saw that we were coming close to the train station. And when we came in the station, we looked up, and we saw there the, those small wagons, those, kettle, those small kettle cars. And on one side, I looked one, one way, and the other way, I, saw, I couldn't see the end of them. <coughs> and they were all open. And soon they started to shout. Everybody go into the ca in the cars, and we had no choice. There were the guns and the whips and rods, so we all went to the cars, the real cars, and we thought we were filled already, you know, because we, we could push in ourselves everywhere, and there were there wasn't no mu much more room left. And then when they start, they push, were pushing all the other, filled up all the other cars, and they had some leftover juice. Then they brought it to each different car, excuse me, each different car, and pushed some more because I, I from the beginning pushed myself to uh, to the wall and brought my family next to me. And because the wall, by the wall, they had a little, a little spot where there was between between the boards, and a little air was coming out, coming in plus, plus you could see out, and that made me a little bit more comfortable. And as I was there, and we already they, they closed the gate. They didn't give us water. They didn't give us the, the food. They didn't provide us toilet facilities. They locked up the wagons, and I hear the the wheels screech, and we are going someplace. They never told us where, why, what we're gonna do, what we're supposed to do. Nobody talked to us. We are on our way. We were all sad because we didn't know where we're going or where we end up or why. And that's a terrible feeling. We were going already a little while, and then the, then the train stops. And, the, and the, the train stops because they were, we arrived to a station of some kind in Poland, and they were getting getting some water on the train or whatever they needed to run the train. <clears throat> and I could look out through that, through that space 
and I saw there the workers. And they were, they were happy, showing all kinds of faces to, to us, and showing us, we're going to be killed, you know? And that upset us and scared us even more. The Polish people that we don't even know, and they, they are very happy that we're going to be killed. Well, we were crying. Crying come, came very easy those days. Well, we went forward, we went further. We came to the next station, and this was also in Poland. And I looked out again on the, through that, do, through that uh, hole. And my God, the same country. What different faces. So sad. So full of compassionate, uh, compassionate, and so full, you could see the sorry for us. They were sorry for us, but the, the, the complete opposite of the first station. And that, I, that, that made me realize one thing. In, one, in the same country, there can be all kinds of people, good and bad and worse. So I learned a lesson there. And then we went further. And by the fourth day that we were in this, in this train, we came to a stop. Didn't know where or why. But I, we heard the, the keys opening the gates. And when they opened the gates, we saw the light. Because where we were, it was dark. And, and we couldn't, couldn't focus on the light. So we didn't know what was really happening. But we heard the shouting of the Nazis. Terrible hollering in German. Ugly names they called us. I was fluent in German that day, those days. I don't know what they were calling us. I never heard those words before. They didn't teach us in school. But they were just as mean as they sounded. They were pushing, they were, they were showing, they were hollering, they were shouting. Fast, fast, fast. No place to go. You have people right, right in front of you. So you. There was no place to go, but they were just shouting at us to, to go. Well, my dad. They were shouting everybody out without packages. My dad always carried with him a small briefcase with his prayer book, prayer shawl, and his phylacteries, because he was using it every day. Excuse me. Sorry. And he picked it up. And the Nazi saw it. As he turned away from the, from the, from the train, as he picked up the thing, and then we were out already. So he turned, uh, he, he turned around and was walking toward the, we were to walking, uh, tried to walk uh, to, to go outside. But then the, the, the Nazi saw, saw him pick up that thing. And he came over with the rifle butt and started to beat my dad right there in front of me, hitting him over and over. The blood was running from his head from everywhere. I, I don't know where it was running from. And I was crying, and, 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 he, and he was still hitting him until he collapsed dead. Then he motioned to two, two older prisoners, they were in, in striped uniforms, to come over. And they did. And each one had grabbed my dad's one foot, and he was pulling him toward a wagon. As he was pulling him over the 
on, over the, the, the ruffled ground, the, the blood was just, the, the, his head was going up and down, I remember like today. And his, the blood was running out of him and left a mark. Then they came to a truck and they threw him on the truck and I never saw him again. Then I asked him, I looked into his vicious eyes, and I asked him, why did you have to kill him? He didn't do anything. And he looks at me, boy, those eyes, they're still, they're still in front of me. And he lifted up his, his rifle, but he said, you want to go with him? And he was ready to bring it down on my head. And then, on one of the pictures, it shows that I, I, went, I was going to, I didn't want to go with him. I, wasn't, I wanted to go with, for, to see my, to find my mother and my three sisters. And that's where I was going. And I am on that picture. It so happened that they took that picture and, and the Nazis did. And my, my whole family is on it, and me too. And About um, 20 years ago, when my parents were, my dad was still alive, and my parents were living in Oakmont, and I came to visit them, and my mom showed me a showed me the previous photograph that was in a flyer from the Holocaust Memorial Museum and told me, look, this is a picture of us, of me, my mom, you know, my mom, my grandmother, my sister, my aunts. And I looked at my mom and I said, sure, sure, okay. I couldn't see the resemblance. And then she said, well, here's a picture that was sent to America before the war to, we had, we had, we had relatives in the United States, so this picture survived. And you can see the faces are all the same. And it was like, that was the sense of reality that hit me. So we didn't even know about these photos until that time. Here you go. Thank you, Max. I found, I located my mom and my three sisters. Hmm? I located my mom and my three sisters. And I, and while I was, I was watching my dad being killed, all the men were separated from women and children. I didn't see any men there anymore. And we were, we, they ordered us to send in five rows, and we were, we made five. My mother and my three sisters and me made five, and we were marching. Coming toward closer to, to to something to a building, and Mom is on the end, so she saw what happened ahead of us more. So she says, "There is somebody taking taking um, um, taking uh, separating us, separating everybody. If they take any one of you away from me, I'm as good as dead." I didn't know what to tell her. I didn't know anything. So I said the rumor, I, I repeated the rumor that I heard, that we're gonna have the young ones who are gonna, they take us to work, and then on the weekend, the, the, the older ones, the family will get together in the weekends. I don't think that calmed my mom down, but that's all I had. And we come to the point where there is Dr. Mengele, looked very, very efficient in a beautiful white uniform and white gloves and tall, and he was just motioning with his one finger, one gloved finger, this way, that way, this way. So when they said this way, we had to go that way. Somebody, when he, they, he said that way, then 
to my mother and two younger sisters had to go that way. My sister that was three years younger than I, the two of us, we chose to go this way. We were old enough to work. And me going, and they threatening us. My mom, I wanted to look back to say goodbye to mom, to take care of herself. But mom wasn't there anymore. They pushed, pushed them away somehow, fast, until, my, until I had to go without saying goodbye to them. And for us, they always said, if you have valuables, get rid of them. If you have money or jewelry, get rid of them. And in fact, we saw a lot of people throwing money away, bunch of money, and jewelry in bags. Because they scared, they scared them. I didn't have that problem. I didn't have money. I didn't have jewelry. I didn't have valuables. We were walking. We came close to a, 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 a gray building. I, I don't know what, if I'm keeping up with it. I don't, OK. We came to this green, gray building, and I saw their wide steps in a big, wide gate. And each time five people came close to the steps, those gates opened and let the five people in. And then it closed again. And I never saw anybody coming out. So they went in. Then my turn, our turn came, and we did the same thing. They opened the gate, and they said, go in. So we went in. And when we came into a big room, and there were the, the floor was covered with ha with uh, colored hair, hair in every shade, every color. I was wondering where that come from. Didn't know. Then they there was there are about six six uh, Nazis standing in the middle talking telling jokes for it themselves and laughing. And they color everybody, everybody uh, strip. Everybody take all your clothes off. And I never, I have never undressed in front of men before. So I was just standing and waiting for him, for them to leave before I can undress. But there were some Polish girls there that helped the, the Nazis. <coughs> because they were forced to. And they came over to me and started to pull my nice clothes down off of me and throwing it down on the floor. And I said to her, why are you, why are you throwing my good clothes down on this dirty floor? How am I going to find it? He says, you won't. You will get other clothes. So I was naked, and then they pushed me in a chair. She pushed me in a chair. I, it seemed like I had no will at all. I, they, they, they said, now, after they sh uh, she started to shave me, and they shaved me everywhere, then he gave, she gave me in my hand something that they called soap, but it was more like a piece of rug. Pushed me toward, toward the, and pushed me, sorry, pushed me toward a door. So I went there. There was no mirror or not, no place to, that I could see my reflections. I looked. So I was just, I just went, went in there and didn't even think of anything. I was blank. And then my sister came in, and she was, she was shaved. And then I saw how, how I must look, too. And then they both started to cry. That they're doing with us what they want. We were there standing for a while, crying. And then the cold water from the top, on the top of the ceiling, there were some shower, shower um, faucets. And it's, they, they, 
they turned it on and the cold water was coming at us. So at first it shocked us. We got for a second that trouble. And then, and then we got used to it and enjoyed it. Because after four days in that, in that miserable little, be, little train, no washing, no water, no nothing, it felt good to get, to get hosed on. When, 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 then they stopped the hose. We, didn't, we were lucky. We didn't know how lucky we were. We came there and we got the water. When our families came there, 15 minutes before us, 15 minutes bef after us, they got the gas in the same place. Every 15 minutes, there was a shower or gas. And I didn't know it at that time. But, so I didn't know, I don't know how lucky we were we got the water. And then they chased us outside without a tower, without anything. And we had we stayed outside in the cold for hours and they kept counting us. We, were, we had to stand in in attention so they could count us five to a row. And if one made a mistake, they had to count over and over and over until the right thing came out just so that they would push us down like inhuman. Finally, they told us to come in, and I saw the big tables. One was filled with children's slippers and, and shoes. The other table was filled with glass, with glasses, adults and children. And remember, we were, we were separating them. But the third table I saw was full with dangers, with, uh, all kinds of dangers. And there were always also some women that they had to pick up the dangers that had a little piece of, piece of shining something, because that must have been gold. And they had to separate it because they saved those gods, whether it was in the mouth of the dead people or, or in the dangers. Then they took us in and they gave us clothes. I got a little short sleeve pullover, smelly old pullover, and a, and a mini skirt. My sister got a long skirt, so at least she was warm. I had everything. My sister, my sister got a longer skirt, and she was warmer than I, in a blouse. And we were just ready to cry all the time. We didn't know what else to do, and, and, and very cold. And they were taking us out. We came to a, to a barrack, and, and, and the doors were broken. How much time do I have? You have about 15 minutes. Finish up? And, and the gypsies ran out. And I didn't know they were gypsies. That they were pretty dark girls. So, but then they came, I found that, and, and, and the Nazis came and pushed them back into the barrack and called them gypsies, so I know they were gypsies. Then they took us to, to the to the barrack where we were supposed to be. We were standing there for a long time, and I, and I looked up. There was a there was a window in the building, and I looked up and I saw something like it looked a bunch of monkeys. That was us. We were we were standing there, and the, that that um, window reflected us all, and we looked terrible. And I'm looking and looking, and I can't find myself. I felt, I felt, I need to know which, which of those monkeys am I? And I went like this and like this until I looked at myself. When I saw myself, I started to cry. I was so ugly, ugly. I looked like an ugly monkey, indeed. 
So we went for the cry. Now we are in Auschwitz. The, the block the supervisor came and put us to, to a barrack. To a, there were beds for, for, for bed structures, for five beds in one structure. And they put us to sleep. And, and uh, we all got out of there and ran toward the, 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 uh, the supervisor's office and the gate. And she came out and she says, where do you think you're going? What are you doing? And we all heard it. We want to see our families. And he says, you can't. And she, they chased us all in, because she had about 12 helpers. So she ch they chased us all back to the bed. And was, we were there for about five minutes, and then we all jumped up again, and this time more determined. And we were running to the gate. But this time, the supervisor came out with a key in his hands. And, and he says, so you, you want to see your family? We said, yes, OK. We were so surprised that she, she agreed all of a sudden what happened. She opens the gate, and, and it's dark outside, and the smell is terrible. Burning human beings it smells the worst. And then she shows us the, the, the sky was a vivid red. And then she, she points up and she says, look, there are your parents burning. It's like that. And we looked up, and then she showed us the crematorium, pointed to the crematorium, and we believed her right away. And we started to cry. And, and we, ran, we walked back in crying and accepted what she said, because there was that kind of a proof. No more families. Then we were placed in the Then we were already placed in the beds. The, 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 look at this again. When we already were placed in the beds, there was no work for it for us. They didn't have anything to do with us. A couple of days later, when we, they woke us up at four thirty every morning for sale up there to come to us. And the, then after that, the coffee and the latrine we had to go to. And there was no water to wash or anything. None of the none of the faucets were working. And then we were there. <laughs> sitting there, I know. Sitting there on the bed, and they say, everybody out. Go out and extend your left arm. They're wondering why, but we did what they said. They were beating. They, they, they came with the belt very easily, those supervisors. And, and we go out, and, and my, our, hands, our arms are extended, and I see a woman walking toward us with with something in her hands, like a fountain pen, it looked to me. And she grabbed, when she grabbed my hand and started to push that, 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 inch, that, 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 that gadget into my arm, and the blood Blood came out, mixed with the ink, blue ink. It was a scary sight. I said to myself, now, what do we do when we get infected? Nobody answered. So that was our tattoo. 
and that was what they used for us. They took away our names, and and we had a, 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 we were a number while we were in Auschwitz. Then they took us to work in a Weberei. Anybody knows what a Weberei? Weberei, where they weave in a Weberei, they make cloth, you know, with those machines, a loom, with, on the loom. Yeah, and didn't work for us because they didn't have anything to, to feed the room with. So they put us into another room where we had to cut up beautiful things, beautiful brocade um, draperies. And, Beautiful dra uh, draperies and bedspreads, brocade, uh, rich people's clothes, stuff. We, we had to cut it up in, in, two, in, a, in about an inch and a half width. And, and then they put us by tables and chairs. And we, in front of each chair, there was a nail. And we had to make a tie on, the, on, those, on those stripes, hang it in there. And, braided like like you would braid the hair and then roll it up and you had to make so many meters every day. I don't know what they used it for if, if ever they used it, but that's what that was our job. <sighs> but then keeps came came Yom Kippur. Does, does anybody know what Yom Kippur is? It's a Jewish holiday. Yom Kippur is the, the most, the, the biggest holiday in Jewish religion. And it was coming soon. So this lady who was there with three daughters, she was grateful to God. And she says, girls, Yom Kippur is coming. How about let's, let's, let's keep it. Let's do something. So what? We tell them, uh, we tell the um, the block elders uh, not to give us our little bread in the morning, and not to give us that fake coffee, and uh, we're gonna fast, and and we prepare our work in advance, the extra bundle, every day a little bit, so that we would have it for that day, and we wouldn't have to work. And they still had the cold. And we did it. It was all prepared. It was all, pre all prepared. And when when um, the, the day came, everything went as planned, except. What do you think? Hmm? Right there. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so we, we had a, everything ready. We arranged it with the rock elders, the, the food. We arranged the, the work. So now we're, we're light. We're going to work in the morning, hungry, because we were always hungry anyway. So we come there, and all of a sudden, the kapo comes in, and looks around and she noticed that we're not working as usual. So she went to the first girl and was, that she was two girls away from me. And she started to look into the, to the materials and she found the bundle. And she got angry. And she says, what are you doing? And I don't know what she said or she didn't say. But she got a very big beating over the head. And these, 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 um, these couples knew how to hit so that you felt like your head is getting off your shoulder and, and goes rolling on the floor. 
So she beat her up, she beat the one next to me up, and the next to her up, and then it was my turn. And she was beating and beating like it was, like it was a pressure to her. And she was hitting me and hitting me. I thought she would never stop. And I was crying, and I was crying to God. God, why now? Why this? What did I do now? I'm following your commandments. Why am I getting this horrible beating? What did I do? No answer. Quiet. And I said, God, my sister hurts is two, two, two chairs or three chairs away from me. Please make, make her tired so that she couldn't beat her on her up at least. And you know what? She beat me up and she beat one more girl up. And then she says, I'm so tired. What are you guys doing to me? She took those up and she's asking, what are you guys doing to me? And, she said, and then she says, I can't, I can't go on. And she said, my sister was never hurt. Never hurt. So I said, thank you, God. And I don't know what to believe or not to believe on that, but it hit me. Then we were, the, the meantime, the Russians were coming to Auschwitz, to Auschwitz. And one day they said, everybody is on track now. Everybody get up in line. We're leaving. And, and, and the Allies were coming close, the Russians. They wanted us in the room to take away from Auschwitz. They didn't want the Russians to find us there. And we didn't want to go. So they came in the barracks and started to shoot in the air. Next is for you. They were saying, so we got scared, because we were also scared. And, and we, went, we, we went out. They, they gave us a bed. I think maybe they even shaved our heads again. And then they gave us a bigger piece of bread than usually and put us back again into those little, little wagons. So we were taken over to the, where do I, they taking us now? Nobody said nothing. But this time they gave us some water. Other times they didn't. And they took us as far as Bergen Belsen. There was another sign on the, on the gate. Welcome to Bergen Belsen. They always said welcome to this, to this hell holes. So we all unloaded. I was very sick already when I came there. I had a terrible blood infection. And I suffered. And I needed some hold. I needed some water, hot water, something. There was nothing. Some antibiotics, there was nothing. So I was there sitting on the, they told me, she pointed out the ground to us, that's where we were sitting. And then we were sitting there, and some uh, uh, stronger prisoners came over, and they brought us some straw to put under us. I grabbed onto the straw, and some stronger prisoners grabbed, it, grabbed onto the other end and pulled it away from me. I ended up with a handful of straw. Didn't go very far with it. So they did the same thing with the soup. They, they, they grabbed our soup, the, the stronger ones. We came and we got a little tiny bit of soup on the bottom. And I said, we, we had that two friends. I'm sorry. Hold it up a little higher. I'll hold it. You can see I made me forget where I was. You're in Bergen Belgium. I am in Bergen Belgium. So, anyhow, I said to these girls, the two sisters that we friended, and my sister, 
I said, I got to get out of here. They all looked at me. I said, what? I said, I got to get out of here. I don't want to die here after Auschwitz. And, and my sister and the others looked at me like I went, went crazy. Is that one? Wait, 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 wait. It's off. <laughs> okay. Not from so far, family. <laughs> so we, so we go. Come on, we got out of here. They think I was crazy because I said I have to get out. And I very serious, seriously said, we have, I have to get out of here or I die here. And I didn't want to die there. So they, they thought I was crazy because there was no way inside to get out. In the morning, there was nothing to do. In the morning, we went for a walk. There was a good cup of tea there. And I see. And I see my one virgin, two gentlemen standing in civilian clothing. And there are some women, a few women there, and they're selecting for something. I said, look, girls, this is my way to get out of here. You want to come with me? You come. If not, you don't stay. That's your privilege. I'm going right now. And I started to walk toward those men. So they both, all of them followed me, and I had them all in front of me, the, the sisters and my sister, and they, the men told them to go this way. I came, and he sent me this way. And this way was back to where they were. And I didn't want to, that's what I wanted to get away from. And I said, and I started to push myself toward the other side, slowly, slowly. But when, when I came almost there, the man said, didn't I tell you that we go that way? I said, yes, I don't know why, but my sisters went that way. They said that way. Oh, your sisters are there? Okay, you go too. And that's how I was saved. They packed us into a truck and covered the whole truck with some tarp, and they were taking us someplace. Don't know where, didn't see nothing. It was fine with us at that point. And they, we stopped a place. There were condominiums and a big factory. They showed us that you're going to live in these condominiums. You're going to have showers every day if you want. You're going to have food to eat. We bring you eat, eat food from the restaurant. We will give you every, every week clean clothes, not new clothes, but clean clothes, which we didn't see for the whole time when we were in Auschwitz. And, and he, he, he says, and here we are making it possible to live like a human being. But I looked at ourselves and I said, yes, you, you, you're giving us a possibility, but we're not human anymore. We weren't human. We weren't responsible. We were, we were different people. The girl, some, some women still went on the yard, even if we had bathrooms there. And then they, had le they, they gave them lessons and they stopped. But what I'm saying is, that's what the Nazi thing was to get us done. We, feel, we, we, we wouldn't feel human anymore. And that's why they made us do certain things. And, that, and, and by the time we got there, we weren't human. It took us time to get back to something normal. Where are we? So, we were free from that. We were working in a, in a, in a, in a 
spectral. I didn't care who we were with. I just saw that the greeting was humanly and nice, and we were working. Half of us were working one shift, the other half the other shift. They were giving us things. They gave me a, a, a sweater that I ripped and made two pairs of socks. I, I made some knitting needles, some wood, and I, I needed two pairs of knee-high socks, one for my sister. He brought it actually home. He came home in it. The socks kept us warm. Okay. And then they dis they, 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 the allies came even closer to that place and they evacuated us from that nice place. And they evacuated us in, into a one one building and there were the Nazis let out the criminals in Germany or somewhere, and those were our supervisors. And they were making us do impos uh, unnecessary things. Like they, it was raining and cold, and we never were cle uh, dressed warm or gloves or anything. And, and, and we had to, be, be, he, he put us to a big, big um, lot of big rocks, heavy rocks. And they were saying, now you line yourself up so that you throw these rocks to each other. Don't you drop it, because we will be punished. So yes, you will, because those rocks fall on your feet. You'll be punished. So we were doing it, and it, 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 that was a, a very hard work, because it, our hands were stiff and cold. And we brought that up to the hill, all those rocks. Now we thought, good, we finished. We go, they're going to take us out and let us rest a little bit and get warm. No. They said, now you have to bring those things down the way it was. All those rocks, we had to stand back again in the same way, in the same line, and throwing at each other downwards until all those rocks were down at us. Now, what, did they, what kind of work was that? Who did it start? Well, they evacuated us from there to, to another place. And, and then they, in the morning, they gave us some coats, warm coats and sweaters. And they paid, painted a big K air, concentrations lager, on, the, on, on everyone's back. And they said, now, here they gave us a big piece of bread, and they gave each of us a blanket. And they say, and now we're going walking, marching. And that's where the, the, the death march, the in, infamous death march started. We started at 1,250 people in it, in all kinds of conditions. By the time we were liberated, the time that they went, let, let us go, we were 250, and the rest were shot or dried or died or whatever. And that was the end. The end, they, the, the Nazis got together because we were just going in a small circle. I recognized all the signs already, and we were coming to it too often. So I knew that we are at the end of something. So we came, we came they, they got together and started to whisper among themselves, and then they came out and started to say to us, run, run, and hollering, run, and starting to beat us with the rifle bullet if we didn't run. They didn't know. They didn't know what they want. Here they are guarding us so close, and they say, run. They want to shoot us and kill, but they can do it where I am, and we stand it. So, when one of the SS came toward me with a rifle bullet, I grabbed my sister's head and jumped into the forest. We were on a narrow street, paved street, and on each side there were big forests. So I ran with my sister and then, I don't know where I got the energy, 
but we ran until we came to a clearing, and that's where I, we could find the man working. And I, I went to him and I asked in German, what, 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 could you give us something to eat? That was always a question to ask. Could you get something to eat? He said, I, I only have bread and milk to give you. That's fine. We didn't have milk and, and good bread since we left home. And he fed us with bread and milk. It was good. And then I asked him, would you please tell me, where, what part of the world are we in? And he says to me, you're in the Sudetenland. And that was part of Czechoslovakia. I started to talk, speak to him Czech. And he spoke to me. And I said, I would never recognize, I've never been here before, but I wouldn't recognize that we are in Czech. But nobody spoke Czech because they were all German. And the Germans were moving out when, when, when uh, you know, the war was over. And then he says, uh, the girls heard me talk to them, to him, uh, uh, Czech. He says, why don't you talk, tell him that we're going to, we would stay, if you let us stay here and just feed us, we work for free. And he says, you don't have to do that anymore. They don't have to do that anymore. The war is over. Germany lost. You can go home. You can go home, we don't, don't have a penny to our name. How are you going to get home? Because even if it was part of Czechoslovakia, but we were on the other end. We came from the other end. But then, slowly, slowly, we were free. And? I'm going to take over for a second. Um, a, a big part of what my mom went through um, affected me growing up as a second generation because I was being woken up routinely by nightmares that my father was having. He was also a survivor of Auschwitz and Buchenwald and my mom. And um, a part of where my mom was coming from was after years and years of having the nightmares, she finally decided it was time to start to tell her story. And she started to start writing her story. First she started to write it. And that's been, that was like about a 10 year project of her writing her memoirs and getting that, getting that out of her. And as she was able to write it, I think she was able to release a lot of the, um, a lot of the, the, the pain that was in her and be able to start sleeping at night again and being able to, to focus more on her life. Um, it took another 10 or 15 years before we were able to put together um, her book and put that, put that together. And she started doing more, um, started making talks. My mom's going to pull it back for me. Uh, so anyhow, um, when we were putting the book, her book together, I, I, I felt that I needed to address the second generation point of view and also try to put together some of the documentation of what I called the verification. So that was the photographs that we, we were able to get and a lot of other information. But it was interesting because we could see that the, the way it was set up on one side of a wall in Auschwitz is where the SS soldiers lived, and there is a, another photo log that was available from the from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, and it showed these 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 SS officers lighting their Christmas tree candles, singing songs with the accordion, dancing with their with the girls that were there, the blueberry girls or whatever they called them, and it was like they could live their lives and be really, you know, quote unquote nice to each other. And on the other side of the wall, there's 10,000 Hungarian Jews being killed every day. So something was going on. It was like, what's on the other, you know, where, do you, where is that line drawn? How can people on one side of the wall be okay killing all these people on the other side of the wall? And was it just the wall, or was it the next city, or the next town, or the country, or, you know, the world? Because many people knew what was going on with, with, the, with the Holocaust, and not much was, was really done. So I think that's the message to, to get through to here. And my mom's trying to get that message out as far as letting go of, of your anger and, letting, and trying to get involved. Sorry. And trying to be more involved with, um, with making the world a better place and standing up for others or, or getting help for others when they need it. And that's been, a, that's been a big problem here that we've been seeing with the continuous 
genocide still occurring after the Holocaust and the hatred still happening and so on and so forth. Um, it's still in there. So my mom started giving her talks and, and that was a big part of her healing was to get her message across to people like yourselves. So she's spoken at schools and so forth. And I think that's the next part of her, of what, what her message is, is that she got her book together that explained the story, but now what is it like when she tells the story to the people? And how, how are people impacted and what happens there? And I think that's a big part of what's been really important for her. And it's been, it's been interesting when we put the book together, um, we've gotten quite a bit of positive response from it. Um, even got a letter from Mr. Wiesel, which was pretty special for us. Um, and um, we were invited to, the, to Washington, D.C. to sign, to do a book signing there at the Holocaust Memorial Museum. And it was, it was very, very special to see that my mom became a celebrity. <laughs> and she was invited to be, to meet with Senator Feinstein and come to her office and it kept, it kept going. And they were all treating us good. And explain how it felt when you were there, when you were in Washington, D.C., when how everybody was treating you. What she would say was, how it, how it, you know, how could I ever, she's not paying attention to me, but that's normal. Is, is how could I could I have ever imagined be, being in Auschwitz that I would ever be invited and be part of you know, being meeting the senators and meeting the congresswoman? We didn't get to meet Obama; he was busy. But um, they did get we did get a tour of the White House, and uh, so it was special. But the main thing was is that she's touching the, the younger people and you know the common people, and that's that's been very special for her. Um, so I wanted to make sure we had some time to take questions, and you know we're here, we're here to answer any questions you might have. But but mom is you know someone that survived, and more importantly, she's put put her story together, and more importantly, she's spreading the word to people and talking, and that's really I think what's making a big difference in our lives, and in the lives of many others. Um, if there's any questions, yes. Were the Kapos in Auschwitz Jewish or German or Polish? Polish Jews. Polish Jews. Polish Jews. Jews from Poland. They'd they were, they were, uh, they were, they were um, prisoners, and then they got some special thing that they, they made into, into the helpers or or couples, and they, they got some special privileges, and they were doing a very good job for the Nazis. Any other questions? We have copies here. We've also set up a program, because we were planning to talk next week, so um, Books could be, we we're going to make books available to Sonoma State students for half price. We've also got it on an ebook, so for $5, that's half price for that too. Um, starting tomorrow for a week, you can order, order the ebook up also if you're a student. But we can sign, we have some here that we can sign for you if you're interested. Any other questions? Got to be a few here, come on. Yes. What was it like coming home after living with all of, after surviving all this? Coming home? When I came home? Another big disappointment. I came home finally after months because the other, other, other railroad stations were some were bombed. And so they had to stop and then we had to walk a long time until we got home and find another station. But 
when we came home, I weighed 35 pounds. 35 kilos. 70 pounds, 70 or 75 pounds. And 35, 35 kilos. She turned into a butterfly. Okay, I'm a little bit mixed up. I'm 91 years old, so it's like. <laughs> Thank you for listening to my story. And I want to finish what you asked. I came to my house finally, and I, my sister and I, and we, we, we were living a, a, an imagination for ourselves. And a, I, I said that my mom will come home. She will, she, will, she will manage to come home. She was perfect in German. She was an educated lady. She, she was a pretty lady. She will come home. And all through, and that brought me home, that belief that my mom will come home. Now, I am hurrying home. Some place, some co company offered some money, so some, some of the survivors, no, I want to go home. I want to I wanna see mom. And I was running home. I came home. Mom wasn't there. My sister knocked on our door. Nobody answered. We're looking around, and we, cry, and we started to cry. And finally, somebody from our house said, this is not your house anymore. Go away. This is my house. But never open the door or anything. That's kind of a coming home we got. Then I looked up, I said, God, why did, I always talk to God, God, why did you make me, sur let me survive and bring me home? Mom isn't here. The house, we cannot get into our house, they won't let us. What are we going to do? I, I, am, I am a grown-up person chronologically, but I was, I was a child when I came home in my mind. So what, what am I going to do? I, I am hopeless and helpless. And you know, I just looked up and I was crying, my sister too. And I looked up and my neighbor lady from across the street came over. And I was seeing her coming, running over toward me, toward us, and says, come girls, come to my house. I'll take care of you. And you know what? We were loaded, covered with lice because there was no, no way to clean up. And we were, we were skinny. We, were, we didn't have decent clothes. And she took us into, and starved, of course, she took us into her house. She gave us a clean bed. She gave us first a, a bath. And she, she, she went to the drugstore and bought something for the rice. She cleaned us from the rice and gave us clean clothes. It was a nice clean bed and a wonderful dinner. And then I said, thank you, God. Because I felt that God sent her to us. So I'm not abandoned. And then I started to, to kind of think differently. But that was my homecoming. Okay. Yes. How long did she stay with the lady, with the neighbor? Not too long, about three weeks. And then I, I uh, told her that I'm going to pay her for what she did. But then a friend came over who came home earlier from the work for the forced labor camp, and he and he started a business for himself, a Jewish boy. And when he came to visit me, he came he gave me it. When he was uh, he was shaking hands with me, he gave me a, a big bill of the money that they were having there, a big bill. I, I didn't want to take it. He says, "Don't take it. 
for yourself and give it to your, give it to that lady that helped you. Because you can you have, you have no money, you can't take you pay her anyway. And I did that. And I gave it to her and and she was happy because she could use it, everybody could. And 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 uh, that that was it. And then they had a, they had a, the the kitchen for the, the the joint set up a kitchen for the survivors, and we can, we could have one one good meal there a day, and um, slowly slowly, the skinny the skinny uh, uh, us became became chubby, that because they were inviting us the neighbors you know. And they saw my my mother's friends. They 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 saw they invited us for dinners, and they made all the heavy things that mother used to make. And this is so skinny persons. And one night, they, six people invited us for dinner. The same night. I don't remember how I managed it, time wise. But I accepted all six dinners. <laughs> and what else? We went there and we ate all six dinners. I don't know how. She's a good eater now, too. She's a great cook. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. She's asking what kind of aid was set up for the survivors. I believe that, that there was, what do they call it, the joint, the aid to help you with the food, with food or money. I don't. It was the joint. The joint. Joint organization or whatever they call themselves. But uh, I didn't know much about any of those things. And I just knew that they, somebody paid for my meals. And somebody made someone else rich too. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Yes. <laughs> How did you come to the United States? I, I, I think one, one other thing that happened real quickly, and we're out of time, but I'll just say it quickly is. As I was going through trying to address what it was like being a second generation, I needed to address, um, kind of go deep and personal, but part of it was learning to forgive. Um, as a second generation, I really didn't want to have anything to do with Germans or Germany. Um, and I started to go, well, I have to learn how to forgive. So do I forgive the Germans? Do I forgive the Nazis? What do I forgive? Which I, I was saying it, and it was hard to, hard to imagine it. And it, it finally, after working it through with my mom and with others, it was the reality that I can't forgive the Nazis that did harm to other people. Only those other people can forgive those, those Nazis. Um, what I can forgive, and what it really came down to, is I can forgive the Germans who were never born at the time. And um, as I went through that process, and it was about a two, three month diving deep into myself to come to that terms, it was like something clicked and all of a sudden um, we had an issue when we were finishing the book up and mom fell and hurt her knees and we were getting, an ex getting x-rays at Kaiser in Maui. And there's this really happy lady, probably in her 40s at the time, blonde lady, and she's just real friendly, let me come into the, to the x-ray room with her. And, and I'm see seeing this really happy lady, when she starts to get my mom the x-ray, she goes to give it to her and she comes back out and her whole disposition has changed, and she's not happy anymore, and then it goes, something's going on here. She goes about to reposition my mom again, sees her tattoo, and then starts breaking down in tears, and starts begging my mom for forgiveness. And what is she wanting to be forgiven for? She's a German, and her uncle was one of Hitler's advisors. And my mom's response was, well, you weren't even born then. You weren't even born in the war, during the war. You know, you're, you're, you're not responsible for for having an evil uncle, you know? And, and that kind of hit me hard there. And then, then as we were flying back home from Hawaii, we're sitting on a plane, and this young lady, probably in her 30s, sits next to me. 
and she's from Turkey. And I'm like into all of this writing, and I'm asking her, so tell me about the Armenian genocide. You know, what? Do you, what? Do you, you know, how's how's that? What's 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 your thoughts about that? At which point in time, she was telling me that there was no Armenian genocide. The Turkish people were just protecting themselves against the Armenians. The Armenians started it all. And it was like, whoa, this is, this is somebody young from Turkey. And what a difference from the other lady. And then like two weeks later, I'm at a, I was at a healing center, and I meet this, this lady who's German, who again is in her 40s, so she's born after the war. And as I was telling people, I was there for a week, you know, starving myself. And <laughs> as I was talking to some people, they didn't care what I did for a living, but they were interested in the book, and I was telling them about the book. And as I got done telling the story to these two ladies about what we were doing, the German lady was behind me. And she says, Dennis, can we, can we go for a walk outside to get some food? I go, fine. She says, did you know I was German? I go, yeah, I could tell from your accent. And then she's, she breaks down in tears. And she's crying. And she's asking me for forgiveness. She's not asking my mom. She's asking me as a second generation. And that one kind of really hit hard at home. So it, it what really... What really came out of, of all of that was realizing that, that there's, there's a, there are people in Germany, or that the perpetrators, the heirs of the perpetrators are affected also when, this, when these types of genocides and holocausts occur. And there's a healing that needs to be done there. But it's, it's got to be from the perpetrators who have, admitted what they've done, and I guess Germany has done that. I never thought I'd stick up for Germany, but they have versus Turkey is still denying it for the Armenian genocide. And so there's, there's a healing that needs to happen for perpetrators as well as second generations of survivors. And I think that happens probably with, you know, with many different people, groups of genocide victims and perpetrators. Now it's something I never anticipated or thought about before. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.